And the three hours really are on Earth system software, Earth system models that we, at least like many of us, built in Julia. And I feel like there was a, definitely a very good opportunity to get people here together to kind of talk about this idea of like how do we actually build these software and can we somehow come up with like a certain, let's say, like certain way of how we do this, especially like given that Julia has a couple of different programming features that other for uh, languages like, let's say, Fortran, for example, don't. And uh, so we really want to dive deep into this idea of what is the anatomy of our models that we built. And so that's why we came up with this like Phoenix or Cyborg. And I feel like I got a couple of questions on that. So just to quick, quick, quickly explain this, it's really this idea that if you have an existing Phoenix, let's say a Fortran model, and then you say like Fortran is dead, let's do something else, let's do Julia, but you actually just replicate the same concepts that you already have written in Fortran, and so basically the phoenix is just reborn from its ashes. And then on the other hand, you have the cyborg, where you say you have an existing model, but actually you can enhance it with new features that are not human, but that are some kind of new machinery, and so this is where the cyborg comes in. And I hope we basically all realize that we're building not just, we're not just creating phoenixes, but we're actually creating cyborgs. Um, exactly. So we have a couple of uh, speakers coming up in the next, uh, over the next three hours. We'll have a quick break in between. Um, but in order to set the scene, I feel like what we probably all kind of started to agree on is that if you think about this space of, on the x-axis, you have some kind of user as well as, and this is what I find very important, uh, developer friendliness. So how easy is it to use your model, but also how easy is it to extend it? Uh, to kind of hack around with it, to kind of do something with it. And on the y-axis, you have something like performance. And I feel like our current state of um, uh, climate model or Earth system model development is kind of like twofold in a way where a lot of people use Python for the easy stuff uh, because it's easy, you can easily write something down. Um, you can obviously use other high-level languages that you want, but just as an example, Python. But you may then end up with a rather slow code. And then on the other, other hand, like the really old-school models uh, are written in Fortran, which are way more difficult to use, way more def difficult to extend. Uh, but we have used them because they were fast. And nowadays, obviously, there's been a lot of people that try to kind of like gap uh, bridge this, this gap in between, so you have maybe like a Python interface to a Fortran model, but in the end you're kind of just like moving up and down on this on this diagonal. And I feel like with Julia there is absolutely the, um, the opportunity to explore this top left corner. I mean, no one really wants to be in the top bottom right corner, but in the top left corner definitely there's an opportunity for Julia. And this is only part of this space, and I feel Another part of this space is where you replace the y-axis not with performance, but with software complexity. So obviously there's like very large models uh, written in, or like very large uh, software written in Python, uh, but I feel like because of this like fast, slow issue, People have basically said like, well, let's do it in Fortran because we don't know if we build something that big, if we actually build it in Python, whether we could, uh, whether we could have ever reach the performance that is necessary. And so here again, I feel like there's absolutely an, uh, an opportunity for Julia to be in the top left corner, and especially when it comes to really big models and not just like a couple of lines of code, hey, this is how we can write this really easily in, in Julia, but if we actually end up building really big models. Um, and so I hope in the next three hours we'll get some answers on that. Uh, how we can kind of like maybe even come up like conceptually with something like a blueprint of like how do we write the software uh, so that we uh, guarantee uh, that we always end up in these like top top uh, left corner there. So exactly how and I feel this is one of the things that our community can definitely tackle in the in the coming years is how do we build complex earth system software that is easy to develop and use but it is also fast at the same time, because our current models aren't, and I feel we can shake this whole space there a little bit. Um, so uh, we're currently at the intro, then we're gonna hear uh, Greg after that Scala. I will talk a little bit, then Julia will have at the moment scheduled a break for 10 minutes, because otherwise three hours are a bit long. Um, and then the second part will start with Sarah. Uh, Lisa Reynolds unfortunately had a canceled flight, so we will somehow like, um, uh, allow people to have a little bit more time, so don't be too stressed if you run a few minutes over 
that should be absolutely fine. And then at the end, we really want to have a little bit more of overflow discussion time, as well as an outro where I feel like we should absolutely discuss like what could the, be the next step? What could the next steps be um, in terms of like, do we have something like a, like a monthly meeting or so where people come together in order to kind of keep this community alive and kind of bring us forward so that we can say like, hey, Julia is not just like a niche language, but actually we can uh, do a much better job with it and we can solve problems that people that are still stuck in the Fortran world think are impossible to solve. Great, and so I think this is where I would like to stop with this introduction and then hand over to Greg. Exactly. <laughs> so, meaning I should uh, give you a very, very long introduction. <laughs> no, I'm an, no. Okay. So, this is Greg Wagner. Um, I need no introduction. You need no. Okay. <laughs> Someone who needs no introduction. Um, maybe the one of the maybe the mastermind behind Oceanetigans, and so he's going to talk about surprise Oceanetigans. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, how to make things fast on GPUs, ocean flavored. Not just ocean fluid dynamics, but ocean flavored fluid dynamics. I am actually not going to talk too much about GPUs, although it's just sort of a given <laughs> that we run on GPUs. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, as Milan said, I'm I'm Greg Wagner. Um, I'm a research scientist at MIT. Uh, I'm working on this uh, climate modeling alliance project to develop a new climate model, uh, trainable climate model. Um, and at MIT, we work on the ocean component um, with some help from Julia Lab. Uh, so, this talk, so this talk I have, there's two main parts. One, I'm just gonna um, give you a uh, brief introduction to Oceanigans um, and explain what we can do and how we do it. And then I'll, the second part of the talk, I'll try to dive a little bit deeper and I'll discuss one aspect of the abstractions that we use, um, which allow us to, which are you know a core part of our user interface and our software design. So Oceanigans is the ocean component of um, what is the, of Klima's trainable climate model, which is currently under development. Um, and so you you know I there's a diagram of an Earth system model over on the right left, right side, um, and the ocean is just one tiny component of the very big and complex Earth system model, um, but it's important. Um, and I think what the way our philosophy, like what Oceanigans is fundamentally, um, is the way we, we think about it is that it's a library for uh, building or coding simulations of idealized and realistic fluid dynamic scenarios. So um, a user of Oceanigans is a programmer who writes a script that implements a numerical simulation. Um, and I think that's a little bit of a different philosophy than many ocean models have been, than, that many ocean models use. Um, for example, um, other, you know, a, a traditional ocean model written in Fortran is gonna think of the user as someone who passes a configuration file to, um, to sort of a black box that then spits out the data at the end. Um, but in Oceanigans we, Oceanigans, we try to reveal more of the innards to give users more flexibility um, and also make scripts um, clearer, like more clearly represent um, the numerical experiments that um, are being implemented. So, you know, our, our goal is both to make the science more reproducible and easier, easier to learn, to shorten that learning curve, um, and also to make um, more complex simulations, complex simulations in creative science possible. Um, in terms of uh, like the nuts and bolts of Oceanigans, you can kind of, if you're familiar with the MIT GCM, which was developed at MIT, um, it's very, the numerics and the internal, you know, you know the, the numerical methods that we use are similar to the ones that MIT GCM uses. Um, what Oceanigans adds, the primary thing that it adds is that we run on GPUs, which makes us very fast and efficient. Um, and so the reason why you should care about Oceanigans, other than the fact that it's written in Julia, which is probably why you're here in the first place, um, so maybe it doesn't even matter, but um, we find that Oceanigans is very fast and efficient. So it allows you to run large problems with minimal resources. Um, and that's because we use the GPU and also some of the 
um, through careful code design. And then the other reason to care about ocean anagans is that it's friendly, so it's easy to use, and it's flexible, as I was saying. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so I'll just give a, I'll give a very brief tutorial to ocean anagans first to start out. Um, and this is from the, this example is taken from the ocean anagans readme. So, um, in, the, in the block of code, there are seven lines. And what the seven lines do is they set up a, uh, a, a simulation of freely decaying turbulence initialized with a random velocity field that runs, it's non-dimensional, so it runs for four time units. Um, and so uh, this illustrates, so I think one of the things that we wanted to illustrate here is how, um, how we, ha um, what the type hierarchies are in our code. So this sort of illustrates a type hi hierarchy in Oceanigans. Uh, the end point of an Oceanigans script is the simulation, um, which you know, a typical Oceanigans script will have a run simulation um, towards the end. Um, and a simulation is, is built, it's, a, it's built in terms of a model which represents um, a continuous set of equations that um, is the basis for um, the fluid dynamics model. So in this case, we're using a non-hydrostatic incompressible model for fluid dynamics. Um, and then the model depends on um, a grid which represents the physical domain in which the simulation is being um, um, run. And so then the last line, you see that um, there's a little comment at the end. Um, so this simulation is set up to run on the CPU, but um, what the way, in terms of the user inter, the way that we've built hardware agnosticism into the user interface, in other words, the way that we allow users to switch from the CPU to GPU is by changing um, the first argument to the grid. So that's in principle, and for simple setups, that's all you would have to change um, in order to run on the GPU. And that's the, making that switch from the CPU to the GPU easy is an important element of our software design because we believe that you know, the, the, a, an efficient workflow for setting up um, sim, like big simulations is to prototype things, get things set up rapidly on your laptop, and then increase the resolution and run on the GPU or multiple GPUs. Oh, yeah, that's what I said. Okay, so another core aspect of Oceanigans design is a system for um, computing diagnostics that are a function of the, of, of the data of the model. Um, so here I'm illustrating how you would compute something called vorticity from the model velocities from this simulation that was just run. Um, and um, I guess the main point here is just that um, we've, tried to, we've tried to design it so that users who are, who are uh, physical scientists can use a syntax that resembles the math, um, the math that they know uh, to, to write code. Um, and that's another, you know, that's another important feature of Ocean Anigan's ease of use. Okay, so that's, that's an end to the tutorial. Okay, so um, I just wanna run. So another, um, Another thing that we're proud of in Ocean Anigans is that we're relatively flexible compared to other ocean models. So um, at the example I just showed you is the one on the left, which I would I say that's a classroom example or a simple idealized example that you could use in the teaching environment um, or just to, um, to teach Ocean Anigans. Um, we also support a type of numerical simulation that you could regard, you could call small scale process studies. So these are simulations that are meant to reproduce laboratory experiments um, or represent a limited area of the ocean at a high fidelity. Um, so we're studying a particular ocean process rather than the whole ocean. And then in addition to that, we also support uh, global ocean modeling, um, although that's kind of the thing that we're still um, working on right now. Um, so that's sort of a work in progress, I'd say. Um, but, but so that's a, another thing that we're proud of in Ocean Anigans is that we allow users to, um, it, with one software ecosystem, we can, um, we allow users to study a wide range um, of physical scenarios. Okay, so now I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into, um, into the user interface and also the innards of Ocean Anigans to try to explain, um, well, how we I think that we achieve uh, ease of use and also um, we have a, how our software design, uh, how we achieve extensibility and modularity in our software design. 
Um, so the core, one, one of the core elements of any numerical experiment is something that we call the model, um, which loosely speaking represents, um, it, you could think of the, the basis for a model is a partial differential equation. So in this case, I'm, I have an example um, with the, our hydrostatic free surface model. Oceanianigans Ocean has three different models that we support. Um, in the hydrostatic free surface model, one of the equations that it solves is the one at the bottom, which is the Navier, um, hydrostatic Navier-Stokes equations. This is for horizontal momentum, what I'm showing. Um, so Oceaning is user, the, the interface for setting up a model. Uh, when you set up a model, um, you, you, sorry, let me reset. So the way that a user sets up a model is they specify keyword arguments in the model constructor. And um, the way that you might think about it is that each keyword argument represents a term in, the, in this um, equation which represents um, the, the, physics, the physics of the problem. So um, in this example, I'm showing uh, a model constructor that has three, where the user has configured three terms in this hydrostatic momentum equation. They've, they've configured the advection term. So in this case, they're specifying a numerical scheme for the advection term. They've configured a Coriolis term, which is in green. Um, and so in, that, in this case, um, the Coriolis keyword argument, it determines not only the numerics, but also the physical meaning of the term. Um, and then they've also specified a closure term, um, which is sort of a catch-all phrase for all of the other stuff um, that enters the model in addition to the other um, five terms there. Um, and so, and so this, this, is, uh, this, this is how we achieve modularity because users can um, change the um, behavior of each term independent from one another. So they can keep one momentum advection term but change the Coriolis term. They can keep the momentum and, and Coriolis fixed and change the closure. Okay, so under the hood, okay, so now let's go under the hood a little bit more. Um, so that's, that's the user perspective of how a model is configured. Now, under the hood, um, the, most expensive, um, the most expensive calculation that we do um, in the course of taking a time step of the model is to evaluate the tendency, which is the right-hand side, a, a discrete representation of the right-hand side of the equation below. And so um, those keyword arguments that I showed map one-to-one -to, -one to terms in the source code um, that calculate the contribution of each of these terms to the tendency. Um, so I, I think, yeah. So this, is, this sort of shows how the user input is changing the content, um, the, the, co the, the computation um, underneath. Um, and I guess, okay, so what I'm, what I'm hoping to illustrate um, by showing you the source code is, um, how this achieves extensibility. So say now that I, I'm interested, um, o, I'm, Oceanigans does not support a particular type of closure um, that I would like to implement. Um, in order to implement a new closure in Oceanigans, this, um, you know, in the Julia way, this requires um, developing a new closure type. So here, for example, I, the, the type of the closure is horizontal scale diffusivity. If I want to develop a new closure, I implement a new type, and then I extend those two methods in red um, in order to implement a new contribution to the tendency associated with that closure. Um, so, this, so this slide illustrates, in a nutshell, how you would do that. Um, in addition to, you know, in addition to, just, you don't, so the, there's, a, there's sort of a, um, there's a hierarchy of ways that you might um, insert yourself into Oceanigans. One could be to simply redefine that function dj tau 1j, for example. That's the contribution of the uh, closure to the u component of the equations. Or you can also leverage um, some abstract types that we have, some internal abstract types that um, capture common patterns for in, in closures that people um, are interested in implementing. For example, one abstract type we have represents a scalar diffusivity, so that's a diffusion is a is a is a very common type of closure that people are interested in um, simulating or using, um, and so if you're if you're going to implement a diffusive closure, then you have you can write a lot less code um, in order to extend Oceanigans, and then so you know I, as I was saying, 
the writing a new closure involves implementing this type, my new parameterization, and then in order to use it in the model, as long as you've extended all the methods properly, you don't have to do this within the oceaning in source code, you could do this anywhere you want in your own script, for example, um, then you simply pass your closure into a model and it should, if there's no bugs, it should work. Um, okay, so I think I'm on time. Um, Okay, so what's next with Oceanigans? I think, uh, so right now, Oceanigans is, is mature for doing um, both the classroom examples, it excels at that, um, and it's also mature for doing small scale problems, these process studies. Um, but the thing that we're working on right now is building um, maturity in our uh, capability for global ocean modeling. And in particular, we're interested in doing high, res high resolution modeling on multiple GPUs, that's because um, we found, so the, the, the figure on the bottom left is showing um, the uh, efficiency of ocean endings in terms of this metric, simulated years per milliwatt hour. Um, so that's how, many, how much energy it takes to simulate a year um, of ocean turbulence, basically. Um, and it illustrates that ocean ending is, ex is exceeding the state of the art. So I think um, we are trying to argue that we haven't just achieved, you know, writing a new ocean model in Julia, but we've actually achieved We've, we've exceeded the state of the art in terms of performance and efficiency, um, which would be important no matter what language we were using or regardless of how easy it, to use it was. Um, and then after that, the next step, of course, is to couple with the other components of Klima and train a climate model like a neural network. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Getting those two data points on the left, your two stars for ocean shenanigans, how is that getting above uh, in, in terms of efficiency uh, codes that are presumably written for Why is it so efficient? Yeah, so we so we we have theories for why, but we don't have, you know, we can't prove um, the reason. We Oceanigans one of the one of the I don't know if you were there for um, Simon's talk about porting from CPU to GPU um, earlier today, um, but I guess I asked this question, um, is it important to optimize on the CPU before you port to GPU? Um, in Oceanigans, we didn't, we've never optimized for the CPU. We focused completely on the GPU from the beginning. Um, and I guess it's our impression that many other models, so Veros is not, Veros, is, I wouldn't regard Veros as like a mature ocean model. It's like a sort of an experimental ocean model that's written in JAX, um, and it achieves good performance as well. It's written for GPU too. Um, Oceaning is written in Julia. Um, Julia is probably like the way that we've written the code is better suited for high performance than using JAX, for example, which you have to make some compromises. So that's why we might be better than Veros. Um, and in terms of the other models, I think because we focus on GPU from the beginning, memory efficiency, and um, GPU specific performance, maybe that's why, yeah. Do you think the structural advantages of Julia will prevent small developing other languages from matching Julia's small ocean engine? No, I don't think, I think Julia is, um, I don't think, I don't think Julia makes it more performant intrinsically. I think it makes it easier to develop a performant model. Um, yeah, well, you know, given teams of the same size and the same resources devoted to the problem, that would be the case, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, ocean anigans, every, the numerical algorithms require orthogonal grids. Um, so everything, it's a finite volume method for, we use finite volume methods to discretize partial differential equations and that's what we do at, at our core, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, what, what was the word you used, you said? 
ah, we we assume quadrilaterals. Yeah. We support CUDA, but people are working on AMD as well. Um, yeah, you could ask Chris and Ballantin about that. And maybe the other people here actually too, that I don't haven't met yet. <laughs> Say what? Yeah, so uh, O'Shanigans, we use kernel abstractions under the hood. That's um, how we achieve hardware agnosticism. And um, so, it, Kernel abstraction supports AMD GPU, and then there's a little bit of extra work that we have to do um, to make all of O'Shanigan's support AMD. But that, that is a work in progress that I think is probably pretty close. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Let's thank Greg once more.